Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I am honored to introduce our guest this evening. As I expect most of you know, Sarah McBride made history in 2016 as the first openly transgender American to address a major party convention. She is also one of the first transgender people to work at the White House, and in that capacity, she helped influence the Obama administration's stances on trans issues. Sarah formerly served as an aide to Delaware Attorney, Delaware Attorney General Beau Biden, and she's currently the National Press Secretary at the Human Rights Campaign. In her new book, Tomorrow Will Be Different, Sarah takes a deep dive into her story of love, loss, and accomplishment as a doorway to a larger discussion of identity and LGBTQ rights. Tonight, she'll be in conversation with Pennsylvania State Rep Brian K. Sims, former staff counsel for policy and planning at the Philadelphia Bar Association. Brian recently stepped down as both the president of the Board of Directors of Equality Pennsylvania and as chairman of the Gay and Lesbian Lawyers of Philadelphia. As his resume and his arguments before the State House attest, he's a tireless advocate of equality in all its forms. Please join me in welcoming Sarah McBride and Brian Sims to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Hello, everyone. Um, Sarah, Philadelphia. Hello, Philadelphia. Philadelphia Sarah. <laughs> Happy Pride. Um, so uh, Andy, on, as we were walking in, was talking to us about how much time we have here. And it sounds like we've got about 30, 40 minutes or so to, for us to talk with Sarah. And then we're going to take some questions for a little while. So as we're talking, certainly be thinking about questions. If you're rude, just shout them out. We'll probably get them answered anyway. Um, just by a showing of hands before we begin, how many people in the room have been in an event with Sarah or have met her before? Oh, wow. Oh, good. Good, good, good. So right from the get-go, you know you're among friends. I can't repeat myself, though. <laughs> <laughs> you can feel free. We're, we're friends. We don't mind at all. Um, and before we begin, why don't you tell everyone where you're coming from, what your day was like? Sure. Well, first off, it's wonderful to be here. It's certainly the highlight of my day to be with so many friends and to be with Brian for this conversation. So thank you so much. Uh, I actually just drove straight up from Dover, Delaware, the state capital of uh, my home state of Delaware, where the state legislature, the state house, just passed a bill protecting LGBTQ youth from so-called conversion therapy. And so, <laughs> some very good news in a sea of oftentimes not so great political news. Uh, and the bill now heads to the governor's desk who uh, is expected to sign it, and Delaware will join 13 other states plus DC with these laws uh, protecting LGBTQ youth from this really dangerous and discredited practice. So it's a, it's a good day all around. I'm notably not Pennsylvania. I'm sure everybody in the audience knows that Pennsylvania yet, we have not, not in that 13. been able to ban it yet. No, we need a, we need a, a change of leadership vote. Everyone we need vote. more Brian Sims in the legislature. Um, we're right. gonna get a bunch more this, yeah. this next cycle, I think. Um, why don't you tell everyone, just so that everybody understands here, and I, I heard during the introduction a little bit was explained, but why don't you tell everyone what your job title is right now? What do you do today? Sure. So I am the uh, National Press Secretary at the Human Rights Campaign, which is the nation's largest LGBTQ civil rights organization. I see a couple folks from uh, our HRC Philadelphia Steering Committee here tonight, so it's wonderful to see you all. Uh, HRC works at the local, state, federal, and international level uh, to uh, move equality forward through passing inclusive laws, uh, opening hearts and changing minds, uh, and uh, pushing office workplaces, hospitals, uh, to adopt more inclusive policies and practices. So we're working both in the legal equality sphere, but also in ensuring that we uh, advance equality uh, for people outside of legal equality so that we can have true lived equality for every single person. So I've been there for about two years, and uh, I get to travel around the country in my job and meet the wonderful members of the LGBTQ community in every state around the, around the country, which is wonderful. I was just looking for a title. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Sorry, I'm yeah. kidding. No, that's, uh, <laughs> I, I, thank you. You asked thank me to you, talk about you. HRC, and I have to give uh, a little bit of a synopsis. Uh, it's, it's why you were exactly where you belong. <laughs> um, so I, you might not know that Sarah and I, um, over the years, have become, have become pretty decent friends. And as I was thinking about prepping for this, there was a whole lot of questions that I had for you as well that you, know, you and I have never just had a chance to sit down and kvetch just us in, in Philly. 
And so I, I, I kind of want you to start from the beginning. We, we're going to have time to talk politics. We're going to talk about American University. I want to talk about CAP, the DNC. I think you know a Biden or two. <laughs> um, but I'm really curious, what were you like as a child? What were your parents describe you as, like, as a five or six-year-old? Well, I've always wanted to be described as someone's pretty decent friend. That's a. That's <laughs> we're getting, getting better. Getting better. <laughs> um, you haven't uh, seen me like early in the morning. You haven't slept at my place yet. Like, that's true. We have a long a way to go. Give it time. Um, you know, as a as a kid, I was a lot like I am now. Pretty much a policy nerd, a wonk, um, a, a political uh, a, a political aficionado. Um, as a young person, I uh, was a voracious reader of history. And I remember as a young person, as I started to recognize that I'm transgender. And for me, you know, the, the important preface is that every transgender person's journey is a little bit different. Uh, but for me, I, I've known that I'm transgender my entire life. I remember as a young child lying in my bed at night praying that I would wake up the next day and be myself. And as a voracious reader of history and in, in reading the history books, I marveled at the scope of social change that filled their pages. But in reading those history books, it also became abundantly clear to me that no one quite like me had ever made it very far. And as I began to grow up and reckon with the fact that I knew I was transgender, I wondered whether the heart of this country was big enough to love someone like me. And so I kept, uh, kept that inside. I told myself that if I could make it worthwhile for other people for me to stay in the closet by making a difference in this world, by making my family proud, that those things would somehow fill the void and incompleteness in my life. And so I was, as a young person, really motivated, I think, in part, to try to, to do things that would justify staying in the closet. Uh, and, and so I got involved in politics in Delaware. I eventually went to college at American University in Washington, D.C., where I was elected president of the student body. But Sarah, you're getting way, way, I won't way, go way too far. Ahead of I won't, I'm just giving the I'm little still highlights. I'm talking about you as an eight-year-old girl. Little eight -year -old highlights. Child. But what I was going to say is, is through all of that, I was struggling with my gender identity, and I and I think it's difficult for folks who aren't transgender to understand what it feels like to have a gender identity that differs from your sex assigned at birth. I think. When it comes to sexual orientation, most people who are straight can empathize with the experience of loving and lusting, but most people who aren't transgender, cisgender is the word, don't have an analogous experience. And for me, the best word I can use to describe it was a constant feeling of homesickness, an unwavering ache in the pit of my stomach that would only go away when I could be seen and affirmed as myself. So I love politics, I love reading history, but I also loved going over to my next door neighbor's house and dressing up in a Cinderella dress and finally having the opportunity to be myself, but then of course knowing that the proverbial stroke of midnight would hit and I'd have to go back to playing that part that everyone expected of me. And I have to say, I was, I was pretty good at it. When I came out, my dad said to me, he said, I don't understand, you're, you're, such, you're such a good guy. And I said, Dad, I'm such a good guy because I'm actually a woman. <laughs> and, <laughs> And so I guess that's, that's, that's what I was. I was a good guy, but actually because I was a woman. Well, so to that point, and maybe it's, um, it's a, a learning lesson for me, maybe members of the audience, when I talk about you as a child, I just said a moment ago, tell me more about you as a young girl. Yeah. What, how, should I approach, how should I approach your childhood? How should I approach you as a young person? That's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, f f that was one of the first questions my parents had for me after I came out. And even though I just sort of jokingly refer to myself as a young boy who was actually a girl, I, it is important to talk about me as a, a girl throughout my life, talk about me as Sarah throughout my life. And I think it's, it's for two reasons. One is just from a practical standpoint, um, obviously we're in a room full of people who know I'm trans, but if, if you're interacting with a transgender person, you, you don't want to out them in front of other people. But I think the deeper and, and, and more significant reason that you should always refer to a transgender person by the gender identity that they, are, that, that, that they are is to reflect the fact that gender identity is a permanent identity that, we've ha that I've had, for instance, since birth. And it's a, it's a gender identity I've felt my entire life, I've known my entire life. And I think just as gay people aren't straight before they come out, 
um, trans people are the gender identity they are even before they come out. That might be the clearest analogy that I've ever heard. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Um, it also seems clear that you have had um, advocates and activists in your life for your entire life. It uh, would appear to me as someone who grew up with very strong women role models that you might have as well. Is, am I right about that? I, absolutely, absolutely. I, first off, I mean, my mother is my best friend, and uh, not to conform to too many stereotypes, and she is uh, a really strong woman, an incredible person, but more than anything else, the kindest person I've ever met. Um, and so, you know, I grew up with, with her very much in my life, but I also grew up surrounded by a lot of young, strong, fierce women who are, who are my peers. And who, you know, throughout my childhood and teenage years, surrounded me with a community that I knew when I came out would respond with nothing but love and support. Um, but, but, you know, frankly, actually, a number of, one of the reasons that my name is Sarah is that I knew a number of Sarahs who were strong, independent, funny, and I hope I'm funny, funny, intelligent women. And I so appreciated that about them and so respected them that that's one of the reasons why I named myself Sarah. Oh, wow, I think that's fantastic. I'm yeah. just learning that. Um, I would like to talk about you at 17 years old, Young Democrats. I, when I think about what most of us were probably doing at 17 years old, and I, I know some of you in the room, and so I, I know some of you were also out canvassing and working for elected officials at 17, but it's, it's few and far between. But that's, that seems really what you were cut to do. At 17 years old, you were pretty active politically. Why don't you tell us more about it? Sure. So, you know, as I, as I mentioned, um, I, I loved reading history, and I, love, um, I, I loved marveling at that scope of social change in the history books. And... Politics, to me, from a young age, was so clearly the way of leaving a lasting impact on this world, of making a little bit more space for other people, even if I couldn't, to live their life more fully and freely. Um, and so I got involved in politics. I started working in, in Delaware politics for a number of different candidates, a guy named Matt Den, who's now our attorney general. Uh, he was running for insurance commissioner, a, a young uh, man named Bo Biden. Um, Joe Biden's son, who unfortunately um, has passed away from cancer, who was running for attorney general, and then, of course, um, our former governor, Jack Markell, who became really like a, a second father figure to me. Um, and all of these individuals um, were, were so, so kind to me as a young person. Uh, Delaware's so small, and I think it, it really made me appreciate the, uh, the role that a single individual can have in our politics, that a single voice can make a difference. And also, they were all individuals who recognized that young people deserve to be mentored and supported in politics. Uh, and it was actually through those experiences that I, I think I learned something that was really important in my own advocacy, which is that as a young person, whenever we participate in politics, I still consider myself young, we speak with a really unique gravity to our voice. Um, and that gravity is, is the gravity of history, and it's not the history of the past, but the history that remains to be written because young people will be the ones that write the history books of tomorrow. We will get to decide who was right and who was wrong in this moment, and I think elected officials and politicians know that. And so every single time, as a young person, I got to go into these spaces, I could feel that I was carrying with me this sense of history and that the politicians knew that and were sort of drawn to that um, to me and other young people that were participating. Was that part of the gravity towards American? Yeah, well, AU is, as uh, many folks know, located in DC. And it's consistently ranked one of the most politically active campuses in the country. Um, it was between AU and GW, and I wanted a campus. Uh, GW has no campus. Uh, and so take I, that GW. Yeah, take it down with GW. <laughs> Actually, when I was student body president, I declared war on GW. Um, <laughs> And uh, um, I, I went to AU, and I, and I think I also really responded to what felt like to me a, a, a truly progressive, inclusive environment, particularly around LGBTQ issues. And I think one of the themes of my life is even when I was presenting as a straight, cisgender guy, I was building an environment and a support structure 
that would welcome me with open arms when I eventually came out, even though I wasn't yet ready to accept that fact uh, about myself. And so I, I went to America, and because it was a politically engaged campus, because it was filled with other young people who were socially and, and politically engaged, and because I think I, I, I recognized that if and when I came out, it would be a campus community that would, that would love me and accept me and support me. Did you get involved in student government the moment that you got there? No, actually. So I was, I, um, AU is a unique place where student politics is taken uh, very seriously, probably a bit too seriously. Um, and for the first year, I l would read the student newspaper about student government and just go, my God, all of these people think so highly of themselves, and they're all just trying to play West Wing. Elected officials. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so I actually was involved in College Democrats for the first uh, year or so because I felt like that was the place to actually do things, um, to, to have a tangible impact. And then I began to recognize that student government uh, actually had a role in improving things on campus, that we can't ignore the change that's right in front of us. I think so often we get, we get distracted by the important but shiny national or statewide objects and we forget that change moves upwards and that in a, in a, we can't affect change statewide or nationally if we're not focusing locally first. Uh, and so I recognize that student government was actually a place that things got done. Uh, that a person could have uh, a role in, in making their campus community more progressive, more inclusive. Uh, and I think our college campuses should look like the kind of country we, we want to build in 10 or 15 years. So I got involved in my sophomore year, uh, first as an undergraduate senator, and then knocked on every single door on campus. They quickly made a rule where student body president candidates couldn't knock on doors after I bothered everyone. And I eventually won. <laughs> Uh, that race and, and served as student body president for a year. Did you have trans friends while you were in college? No. I didn't know, I met one trans person while I was at American University. I had a maybe four minute conversation with them. It wasn't until after I came out as transgender that I had a conversation, an extended conversation with a transgender person. And that person was actually Mara Kiesling, who's the executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality. But uh, prior to that, I had never had a conversation with a, at least that I knew of, with a trans another transgender person. Um, and you know, I think that that's a, a, a far too common reality for so many transgender people across this country. They, particularly 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, there were few possibility models, role models in popular culture and government in the media, and there wasn't social media to connect us, and there weren't any transgender people that we knew of in our own communities. So it's April of 2012. You haven't had this conversation with other trans individuals. You haven't yet come out to your parents, and you're told that you get to make a speech before the entire student body at your college. Who was the first person that you spoke to about the idea that you might want to use this platform? Well, so I actually, I had come out to my parents on Christmas Day in 2011. Um, I have wonderful timing. Ta-da. Um, uh, I came out to my parents on Christmas Day in 2011. I, I had, the night before I was in, in, in church and sort of on the final night of Epiphany, I had my own Epiphany that I couldn't, I couldn't spend any more time watching my life pass by without living it as myself, that I was so consumed, all consumed with thinking about my gender identity that I couldn't experience the beauty in the world. I couldn't really truly experience any of the full range of emotions that, that we are able to experience as humans. I was so consumed by my gender identity. So I decided that I was gonna come out probably a couple days after Christmas. And then on Christmas morning, I got a present and it was a button up shirt and a tie. And it was such a stark contrast between where I was and where I wanted to be, between who I was perceived to be and who I knew I was, and between the expectations that my family and friends had for me and what I feared, which was that in coming out, 
all of that would come crashing down and that I wouldn't be able to be fulfilled professionally. I wouldn't be able to find love. I wouldn't be able to do all of the things that I had dreamed of. And so that gift, which I had asked for, really hit me in the gut. And my mom came upstairs and said, you seem so down. Why do you seem down? You never seem really down. And I sort of dismissed her. And then I thought to myself, she's asking you the question. You have the courage to say it, just say it. And so I told my mom that I had been thinking a lot about my sexual orientation and gender identity, and I threw sexual orientation in there so that she would know I was about to come out of something. Yeah, you were trying to soften the blow. I was, well, I, you know, I knew if I said gender identity, her mind would be like, I don't know what the hell that is. Yeah. Um, and, and explained to her that I was transgender. And she said, so you want to be a girl? And of course, to your previous question, my mind, of course, was went, no, I'm, I don't want to be a girl. I am a girl. Yeah. Um, but I said yes, and she burst into tears. Ran upstairs to our, uh, my, my father's den, man cave, whatever it is, um, where he was setting up his new Christmas TV with my brother, and she said, go ahead, tell him what you just told me, and so I explained the same thing to him. And we sat there for seven hours and had a conversation through a lot of tears, through a lot of fear, through a lot of you know, questions that I'm sure they cringe at six years later. Uh, but we just talked and I sat with them and tried to answer every question they have. And I think you know, I knew going in that if I was patient with them, they would walk on this journey with me. And they made clear from the start that they loved me and supported me. But they also, particularly the next day, begged me not to take the steps that I knew I needed to take to be myself. And I remember waking up the next day with them both crying, getting in bed with me on either side, just begging, screaming over and over again, please don't do this, please don't do this, please don't do this. And it took my brother, who's a radiation oncologist, to really sort of snap them back into reality and, and sort of to recognize that even though they felt like they were losing me, and in many ways they felt like I was dying, that I wasn't going anywhere. And he said, Mom, I watch, I watch young people with cancer die every single day. You are not losing your child. Um, and it was sort of that a little bit of tough love that I think actually reflects the role of allies, right? As the, as the trans person, I had to be extra patient with them. I had to be yeah. a bit more soft with them. I, I couldn't push them as much. And Sean, my brother, as an ally, could come in and be a bit more forceful and say the hard truths that needed to be said that maybe wouldn't be heard as well if they were coming from me. Um, and so they eventually got to this place of, of total support. And so on the last day of my term, it wasn't actually speech. I, on the last day of my term, I published a note, a, 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 an op-ed in the student newspaper that went viral. Um, and I had come out to friends in the, in the intervening six months who to a person were nothing but supportive and loving. Like I said, I had created this network of of people who responded the exact way you're supposed to respond, which is with which is with love and support and affirmation, and in many cases, celebration, mirroring, mirroring how I was feeling, sort of euphoric that I was finally able to live my life as myself. And the moment I was able to step forward and, and be seen as myself, my mind was no longer cluttered. It was just a, it was a sense of almost meditation and I thought, my God, this is what it's like for everyone else in this world. I've never felt this way before. Um, during that seven-hour conversation with your parents, it had to have been the first time you verbalized so much of what you had been thinking and feeling. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like for you as a person who had, had, been, had known your whole life that you were trans, but had not been able to speak to another person about it, and then, and then having to have that kind of a conversation with the people that you love the most as you, as you sort of both, or all three of you, fumble through it? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, it, it's almost like a cliche. I remember looking in my mirror when I was 16 or 17 and saying out loud, I'm transgender. And then immediately following that, saying out loud, no, you're not, no, you're not, no, you're not. This'll, this'll, this'll pass. Um, and that was really the extent of me saying I'm transgender out loud prior to coming out to my parents. Um, 
you know, I think in many ways, once I came out, it was almost like an out-of-body experience. I, I sort of went into, once I, I got it out there, I felt so good that I knew that I needed to then just step into this role of almost being a therapist for my parents as they worked <laughs> through their emotions. And so I became sort of calm, cool, and collected, warm, but calm, cool, and collected. And I had done so much reading, right? I had spent years reading online, everything I could get my hands on, that I was so well prepared, I think, for every single one of their questions. Uh, and at the same time, I mean, at the same time, though, I, I, I think I wanted them to move, move faster. And someone said to me afterwards, they said, you've had 21 years to come to terms with this. Your parents are just getting this news. It's going to take them some time. And in the grand scheme of things, they're actually pretty quick. Um, and, and again, some of the questions were, were rough. Some of the questions were difficult. Um, but they made clear from the start that they loved me and supported me. And that made me incredibly fortunate. And very powerful. Um, what I know that you did next is that you applied to a White House internship as Sarah. Yeah. Right? And three months later, four months later, went off to the White House? Yeah, so um, the first time I ever put my name Sarah on any kind of official form or legal document was when I applied for an internship in the Obama White House. I, I, I submitted it as an application in the period between coming out to my parents and coming out um, to the school. And so I put in the nickname section Sarah and got the internship uh, in, in August and started three weeks later. They, they don't give you much time. Um, and in the, in the couple weeks before I started, got my name changed, got my gender marker changed on my license in Delaware, and was able to walk into the White House and on that first day and have them say, welcome to the White House, Miss McBride. And for a little kid who's a complete political junkie and nerd, it was one of the most incredible subtle experiences in my life. Um, Do you still have your badge? I don't. They make you hand it in on the last day. Curse but Obama White I know. House. Yeah, all the Trump White House, they probably just <laughs> let them all keep them. Eh, they go to jail. Jared, Jared Kushner yeah, right. has like, failed the security clearance no. 90 times. You traded in for an orange his. jumpsuit. Yeah, <clears> right, yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, ooh. Um, but, but, you know, walking into this, to this place, I was so convinced throughout my childhood that, that my dreams and my identity were mutually exclusive. I could, I could draw on a piece of paper a floor plan of the White House. I was obsessed with it. I mean, it was actually how I first started reading about politics was I started, I loved architecture, and I started reading about the White House at like six or seven. And it was through reading about the architecture of the White House and then reading about the history in the White House that I then, I, I, I found politics. And so being able to walk in there as my authentic self was an incredibly empowering experience. And the role, the internship that I had was in the Office of Public Engagement, which was an office that President Obama had created out of what was called the Office of the Public Liaison, which was historically sort of a, uh, an ignored office that dealt with stakeholder communities or, uh, you know, grass tops leaders. And Obama, ever the community organizer, expanded this office pretty dramatically and made it the front door of the White House. And they had point people working on outreach to the LGBTQ community and women and people of color and uh, labor and women, et cetera. And to go in every single day, this first experience as a transgender woman, the first transgender woman to work there in any capacity, understanding that responsibility, and to see people from all of these different marginalized communities come in to this building, to the people's house, really feeling for the first time that it was their house too. And hearing from this administration about what they were doing to help improve their lives, and then also having the opportunity to give them feedback about what more they could do, I think was, for me, a formative experience and, and the recognition that for all of the cynicism and for all the you know, House of Cards storylines that we see in popular culture, for all the crap that exists right now in politics, that we did for eight years have a progressive president with a White House filled with true believers who were there for the right reasons. I'm in my head, I'm applauding at the moment. <laughs> um, after the White House, you went to CAP? I went to the Center for American Progress, which is a large progressive think tank 
in Washington, D.C., working on a whole host of issues. And I went there and joined the, the LGBTQ uh, team working on non-discrimination protections because I'd actually, in the final semester of my senior year of college after the White House, worked back in Delaware to pass a gender identity non-discrimination bill, which we were able to do. And so I went back, went, went back to D.C. to try to make sure that the change we saw in Delaware happen nationally because the reality remains to this day that a majority of states and the federal government still do not, do not have clear protections from discrimination in employment, housing, and public spaces for the LGBTQ community. Of course, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is one of those states. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that, that I, could make, uh, I could bring that change that we saw in Delaware uh, to the nation and pass comprehensive non-discrimination protections. You met a lot of people while you were there, including a very particular someone. Um, why don't you tell everybody about who you met while you were there? Sure. So um, it was actually at the f first, the first LGBTQ-focused event that, I've ever, that I ever went to was a White House Pride reception three weeks after I came out. And there I bumped into a young, a young man named Andy Cray. I, I didn't, full disclosure, I don't remember bumping into him there. Um, <laughs> But a couple, uh, a couple months later, two months later, he reached out to me on Facebook and with a, a, an adorable message where he said he thought we'd get along swimmingly. Um, we, he asked me out on a date. We went out on a couple dates, started dating um, throughout my last semester of, of college. And then eventually uh, I went to work at the same place that he went to work, the Center for American Progress. Um, Andy uh, was a transgender man. He worked at CAP on a couple of different issues, but his primary focus was expanding access to healthcare for LGBTQ people. Um, he was a, an attorney by training, three years my senior, from Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. He came out as transgender while he was in college, like I said, about three years um, before, three or four years before I did, and as he's three or four years older than me. and. Uh, he was my first love as myself. Our first date was my first date as me. Um, and throughout our relationship, I marveled at his courage, his optimism, and, and his incredible energy. He was truly one of the kindest people, like my mother, that I've ever met. And also one of the most principled. Uh, he, would, he would always challenge me to live the values I fight for at work in my own life. So um, we'd have really difficult conversations where, where he, would, he would challenge me, um, you know, one of, the, one of the interesting conversations, and there's probably folks in this room who, who don't necessarily agree with, with where he came out and where I eventually came out, but we had a conversation about outing anti-LGBTQ elected officials. I've heard of a couple. And <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, you know, a, a more than a handful. <laughs> and, you know, my, my instinct was they're being hypocrites, out them, out them. And Andy paused and he said, you know, I have a couple thoughts on that. The first is that we don't win people over when we out people. But more than anything else, I'm fighting for a world where every person can live their sexual orientation or gender identity the way they need to. And if the principle I'm fighting for is not an unbreakable first principle, then what is? And we can always find altruistic reasons to violate principles. Exposing hypocrites is a legitimate reason to do something. But that's when principles are hard, when you have reasons to break them. And I think it was just such a, a, a really profound example of Andy challenging me to take the hard road and to abide by those kinds of first principles in the way I conducted myself in my own advocacy in my own life. And reasonable minds can differ on those types of questions, but it was just this constant theme of principled, kind advocacy that I think just exemplified the way Andy went about his life. How was learning to date? It was, it was, it was, it was, it, <laughs> hmm. that's a good question. We all have expectations about dating. We all have expectations about the people that we're going to be with. Our expectations rarely ever play out. M most of us have been sort of had some level of, of heteronormativity sort of forced upon yeah. us in our lives. But when you're making it up as you, as you go, how is, it, how is dating? You know, dating Andy was easy. Um, 
I don't think dating as a trans person is particularly easy, uh, but dating Andy was easy. And I, you know, I'll never, I'll never forget our first date. Um, I was out three and a half months at this point. I was super self-conscious about how I looked. And uh, you know, anyone who's trans in the audience can, can, can relate to this experience of sort of walking down the street and evaluating every glance you get, right? Wondering what every, every, every stare means. Does that person know that I'm trans? Is that person clocking me? Uh, is that person judging me? What does that person think of me? Does that person see, uh, see that I'm trans? And, and that f sort of fear that exists that's also one and the same of, 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 that also coexists with this feeling of being read as trans is an implicit statement on our beauty, right? Popular culture tells us that if, if you are seen as trans, that means you quote look, if you're a trans woman, you look like a man, and for a woman to look like a man, they're not attractive. And I, as many people do, internalize that. And so I remember we were walking down the street, I'm uh, evaluating every stare, we sit down, the server comes up and, and I think sort of did a bit of a double take, um, and, and I could see that I think she realized, oh, this person's trans, and I could almost hear this inner monologue of, you know, this guy must be disappointed in his date. Because Andy was, you know, well into his transition and not visibly trans. And I think I hit it pretty well. I, I continued with the conversation in, in a way that I don't think uh, revealed any kind of insecurity or any kind of, of, of negative feeling. And I just remember at one point during the conversation, he started getting tongue-tied and just went, I'm sorry, but, but you're so beautiful. And it just totally put me at ease. And it wasn't the, the appreciation of a man. It wasn't, it wasn't the validation of a man, but it was, I think, the first time in my life that I had ever truly, truly so clearly been seen as myself, that Andy was so clearly seeing me as the woman that I knew myself to be. And, and so Andy made it easy. Andy made it really easy. And, and you know, several years later, I, I, I'm sure people know where the story goes, but that kind of love that he exuded every day, I still feel like my cup runneth over with it. Um, it's so present in my life. And I actually don't have much experience dating after that because I, I, right now, t still feel so much love in my life that I'm not searching for it at this point. Whew. Wow. All right. That's all right. Um, am I allowed to ask you when and how he got sick? So, Andy developed a sore on his tongue in the spring of 2013. We thought it was nothing. Uh, I think he even went in and, and eventually, oh, actually I remember, it, it started getting bad and it started impacting his personality. It started hurting so much that he lost some of the kindness that he had, as I think all of us do when we're in pain. And I remember getting pretty frustrated with him and saying, you know, go to the damn doctor, do something about this. This sore is clearly not comfortable and it's clearly a, a, a situation that can be remedied. And I'm tired of you not being in a great mood about this. So he goes into the doctor and, and they do a little biopsy and it says it's fine. So we aren't worried about it. And he goes in for an appointment to get this sore removed. And I go in with him, it's a little strip mall in Maryland, and halfway through this short procedure, the doctor stops it and says, it's a, a little bit bigger and deeper than we thought, so I'm gonna have to stop the procedure. Again, we still don't think anything of it, and a week later, he went in for a follow-up appointment, and I'm coming, I'm driving uh, somewhere else. Again, we, we're not thinking there's anything major. And I get a phone call from him, and he says, are you in a place where you can talk? And instantaneously I knew he had cancer. Um, and I said, well, I'm driving right now. He said, call me back. And I said, no, just tell me what's going on right now. And he said that he has cancer. Um, and I quickly parked my car. I was, I was driving into the office. I ran upstairs, told our boss that I need to leave. And I told her why. Um, and I walked back to Andy, uh, our 
drove back to our apartment where Andy was just in a daze. You know, I think whenever anyone is diagnosed with cancer, they immediately think of death. Uh, we didn't ever talk about that in those first few weeks. My brother, the radiation oncologist, who again was so helpful when I first came out to my parents, was a guardian angel throughout this process, got us into Johns Hopkins, which is one of the best cancer hospitals in the country, just 30 minutes north of DC. Uh, and he went through radiation, chemotherapy, he had surgery. He had oral cancer, so he had his tongue removed, and part of his tongue removed. And our biggest concern was, at that point, whether he'd be able to talk. Uh, and right before he went into surgery, the doctor came in and said, uh, Andy had previously been, been given uh, a pretty good prognosis that, that the, the amount of cancer and where it was in the tongue would, would mean that he would still be able to talk. They'd take a graft from his arm and, and rebuild the tongue, and he'd still be able to talk pretty much uh, at, at 90 to 100% of where he was. And right before he goes into surgery, the doctor says the cancer's spread a bit more, and we're not sure what the outcome's going to be in terms of your ability to talk in the long term. And so... Throughout that was our biggest concern, and thankfully, by the grace of God, the surgery occurred in a way, and the cancer was 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 um, structured in a way where Andy gained most of his speech back, about 80 to 90 percent. He had a pretty, he sort of sounded like he had cotton balls in his mouth, but he gained most of his speech back. Uh, but then, of course, uh, after getting a clean bill of health, the um, the news came that that his cancer had returned and it had spread to his lungs. You two decided to get married um, without giving away the intimate details. Can you talk to us about that, about a proposal or, or how you decided to, to, to get married? So during the, the, the first phase of, of Andy's illness, I remember asking my brother, Sean, the radiation oncologist, I said, so I, you know, we know what happens if he gets a clean bill of health. What's the worst case scenario. And this is just a conversation between my brother and I, and my brother said, if the cancer returns, it's gonna spread. If it spreads, to a, if it, spreads it spreads to his lungs. And if it spreads to his lungs, then it's terminal. And I asked him, typically, how long he will have. He said, typically about a year. So when Andy found out that his cancer had returned, I knew that it was terminal, but he didn't know that it was terminal. For about three days, I had that piece of information. I, did not, I didn't feel like it was my place to share that with him. I worried that he'd resent the person that told him that. I worried that, you know, it's not my place. I'm not a medical professional. There might be circumstances here that make it different. And so when he found out that he had, uh, the cancer had spread, he said, he asked me, if this turns out to be terminal, would you marry me? And I didn't know how to respond. I was worried that if I said yes, that would suggest that I knew it was terminal or that I thought it was terminal. And so I said to him, let's, you know, let's, not, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's, you know, we can cross that bridge if we have to. Um, and eventually he did find out it was terminal. And the moment he found out it was terminal, I said, I, I, I had three days to repair. And, but you still never know. I said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm right here with you. And to the question you asked, the answer is, of course, yes. So we decided at that point, thinking that he had a year left, that we'd have a fall wedding. We always wanted to have a, a fall wedding. But eventually, it became clear that his health was deteriorating at a much more rapid rate than we anticipated and than what the doctors thought. And as his health deteriorated, and, and even one doctor suggested that he might only have two weeks left to live at two weeks after the terminal diagnosis, Andy's mom and I decided that it was probably the best idea to, to broach the subject of moving up the wedding. Uh, so in his hospital room, uh, in one stay during that last month of his life, I broached the subject, and he said, are you giving up? And I said, no, I'm, I'm not giving up, but it's just, it's clear that the chemo that they're going to give you to prolong his life is going to take a lot more out of you than we anticipated. So maybe while you're, you still have your strength, we should, we should do this. 
we, we called our friend Bishop Gene Robinson, who worked at, at the Center for American Progress with us, and he's the first openly gay Episcopal bishop in, in the country. He's a great guy. We called him over to our apartment and asked him if he would officiate. Of course, he said yes. And he then said, can I, can I throw something for you? Can I throw a wedding? We, we were going to get married in five days. We didn't think of having any kind of real ceremony. I mean, maybe obviously he would be officiating and we'd have our family there, but we didn't think there would be any kind of, of wedding in a traditional sense. And he then offered. And so he, over the next five days, while Andy and I were completely consumed with his health, I mean, he was uh, deteriorating pretty rapidly, so it was, it was a full-time job to sort of help care for him. Bishop Jean and a number of our friends organized a beautiful wedding for us on the rooftop of our apartment building. And we uh, were able, by the grace of God, to get Andy up to that roof. There was a, I remember walking out. The one thing I did that was remotely traditional was I went out with two friends and found a wedding dress. It was the first dress I tried on, and they were able to make, fortunately there weren't too many alterations, make alterations in like a day. Um, I remember walking out in my wedding dress on my father's arm and seeing this gorgeous wedding that they had put together, flowers everywhere, a, a beautiful white tent covering where we'd get married, chairs surrounding it, a wedding cake with two robots on top, because he loved robots, um, and drinks and, and food and so many friends, 50, 50 or 60 friends that had flown in. Um, and so we married on, on the rooftop of our building in August of, of 2014. Uh, and then of course, uh, four days after that, he passed away. Um, I have time for only one more. Ugh. <laughs> I have time for one more question, and then we're going to take some questions from the audience. Um, but do you, do you feel like he knew exactly the woman that you were going to become? In talking with you over the years, I've gotten the impression that he saw in you much of what you see in you as well. Do you think that who you are now, the things that you've done in just the short couple of years since then, would, would feel very familiar to him? <sighs> wow. Um... One of the most difficult question, one of the most difficult conversations I had with Andy was a conversation about three weeks into our relationship, and or three weeks after, excuse me, his diagnosis, and he was sitting on our couch, crying, talking to me about all the things he wouldn't be able to do after he passed away, and he said to me typical Andy fashion, the things that he talked about were the things that he couldn't do for other people. And he said to me, I'm so sorry that I won't be able to be there to tell you that you're beautiful, to tell you that I love you, and to tell you that I'm proud of you. Um, and it was, as I said, the most difficult conversation, but because of that, it, it crystallized the conversation in my memory in a way that has allowed me to hear him say those words long after he passed away. And I remember standing on stage at the Democratic National Convention, which happened two years, um, a little less than two years after he passed away. And I was standing on stage, and they light the arena perfectly. Uh, perfectly. It was just down, down the street here in Philadelphia, and they light the arena where you can see everyone. You can see up into the rafters. And I was standing on stage, waiting to, to begin. And I could see just to my right, standing next to the Delaware sign, were my parents. And in that moment, I thought two things. One, I thought, you were so scared when I came out. I hope you know, I hope you see this arena full of people cheering and, and applauding and affirming my dignity and the dignity of trans people. I hope you know that for me, at least, it's going to be OK. And the second thing I thought was I could almost see Andy standing next to them smiling. And I could, because of that conversation, almost perfectly, clearly hear him say, I'm so proud of you, Bean, which was his nickname for me. And I think about that conversation all of the time. I hear that all of the time. And for me, every single time we, we, we take a step forward as a community, it's a little bittersweet because I know just how much he would have loved it and how much he would have marveled at it and how much he would have been a part of that. Um, 
And, and you know, I talk about this in the book to sort of try to transition us to a, a more uplifting <laughs> note. Um, that my relationship with Andy really taught me two things. The first is that every single day matters. I know it's sort of trite, but it, 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 it's so true when it comes to these conversations about marginalized people and equality, because after he passed, you know, I went through the different stages of grief and, and eventually landed on anger. And I'm not an angry person by nature. It, it, it feels like a waste of time. It's, I'm a lazy person. It's too much energy. But I landed on anger, and I, I couldn't be angry at his cancer. There was, there was just a cluster of cells. I, I couldn't be angry at, at his bad luck. That's, there's no one to blame there. I was angry at society. I was angry at people... Or I was angry at, at the fact that there are people who wake up every single day and when given the choice to love or hate, when given the choice to put barriers up or to allow people to live their life more fully, they choose to hate, they choose to put up barriers. And every single time we ask marginalized people, whether they're LGBTQ people, people of color, women, people with disabilities, Muslim, immigrants, or people living at the intersection of those identities, every single time we ask them to sit back and allow for a slow conversation to take place, before we treat them with dignity or grant them equality, we were asking that person to watch their one life pass by without the respect and fairness that every person deserves, and that is too much to ask of anyone. And so, and so I, I think for me it taught me what Dr. King called the fierce urgency of now that every single day matters when it comes to building a world where every person can live their life to the fullest. And, and a second thing though, and this is the hopefully more uplifting note, is that in the last month of my brother, or, uh, of Andy's life, my brother said to me, this is gonna be incredibly difficult, but look around you and take stock in the acts of amazing grace that will fill your life. And they were truly everywhere from those friends organizing that wedding for us to Andy surviving to the wedding. There was so much beauty in the tragedy. And I think what it taught me is that all of us, even in the darkest moments and even in the most troubling times, we can all bear witness to acts of amazing grace. And that hope, hope as an emotion, hope as a sensation, hope only makes sense in the face of hardship. And so for me, in, in many ways, those experiences are experiences that have given me a strength and a power to get through whatever challenges come our way. And I think for me now, because of that, as a political person, as an LGBTQ person, as an American who is at this moment so incredibly disturbed by what's going on in this country, I'm still able to see these acts of amazing grace that are filling our lives, the acts of amazing grace that are personified through the resistance, the acts of amazing grace of LGBTQ people who are in the face of hate and bigotry and, and politicians who are seeking to roll back the clock on our progress are doing incredible things and both small acts of quiet courage and incredible acts of daring bravery and it is through these moments, these hard, this hardship, these attacks, that we've always made the biggest history and made the biggest strides. And we have done what we have always done as a community, what every single battle for civil and human rights has ever done, and that is transform impossibility into possibility into reality. And it is through that amazing grace that that happens. How about a round of applause? Sarah, what do you feel has been the greatest accomplishment in your life? What is the greatest accomplishment in my life? Um, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give two. Um, the first, I, honestly, accomplishment isn't the, isn't the right word for this, but there is nothing in my life that I will ever do that will be more important than being Andy's partner. He in many ways walked me into my womanhood and I in many ways walked him 
into his passing. And the fact that we were able to be there for one another in those moments, it is, it, it is my ultimate privilege to say that I'm Andy Cray's spouse, and it is the most important thing that I will ever have done. Um, professionally, the most, the thing that I'm proudest of is actually working with Equality Delaware and the Human Rights Campaign to pass gender identity protections in my home state. Um, beyond the actual tangible protections, which are, are life-saving and fundamental and necessary, I'll never forget the feeling the night that it was signed into law and became the law of Delaware immediately. And I got a text from a transgender person who was out to dinner with his family. And he said, I just want to let you know that I'm out to dinner with my family right now and I'm in this restaurant and I realize for the first time in my life I feel like I belong here. And I use the expression of homesickness earlier to describe the sensation of having a gender identity that differs from your sex assigned at birth. But I, I also think that that homesickness is a term that also mirrors our pursuit of finding a home for ourselves in this world. That when we transition, we create sort of tranquility in our soul, but we still ache for a physical home that welcomes, affirms, and respects us. And you can't truly alleviate that pain, that homesickness, through just transitioning or just coming out and living authentically. You also have to build a world that respects, protects, and affirms us to really fully make sure that we feel at home and that we remove that homesickness and to, to know that there were people in Delaware and that there will be people in Delaware for generations to come who feel like they finally belong, that they're part of that community, that that is home. That is, I think, the most profound thing that we, can, that we can help grant to anyone in this life. And to know, and I think this is one of the most incredible things about this moment in LGBTQ equality, which is that to know that the change we are making right now, all of us, generations from now, a young LGBTQ student will grow up and learn about this struggle, this moment in history in their textbooks and never have to know what this progress felt like to all of us because they will never know anything different. That is one of the most profound things. And on that night, on that day, and passing that bill, there was that knowledge that generations would be changed because of it. As a pediatrician, I take care of a number of transgender adolescents, and I'd like to know what advice you would give to a teen who's struggling, mm. either coming out to their family or going through the, the physical transition, which is so terribly, terribly hard in school, um, amongst their friends. So having gone down that road, what would you say? That's, I think that's a fantastic question, and it's, it's a question I get a lot from, from young, particularly young trans people. And I say two things in response, and, and the first sort of sounds like a cop-out, but it really is truly the only thing you can say because it's, it's, it's so necessary, which is that you are the best expert on who you are and what you need, right? I, I can't tell you how to go about, there isn't one way to be yourself. I can't tell you the best way to come out. I can't tell you the secret to coming out because every circumstance is different. But trust yourself and do what you know to be in the best interest of your health, your well-being, your safety. There's no wrong way to be you. There's no wrong way to come out. There's no one wrong way to transition. There's no wrong way to be authentic. And, 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 and to know that whether it's me, whether it's other people, you are the best expert on who you are. The second piece of advice is that I know what it's like to face bullying. I have experienced it in so many ways in, in my advocacy. And, and you know, I talk about, in the book, one experience in particular. I, I, it's, it sounds absurd, but I, so I took a selfie of myself in a bathroom in North Carolina that I was technically barred from being in. And I posted this selfie online and it went viral. I have never experienced hate like the hate 
I had experienced, I experienced after that. I think in many ways it was the first, for a lot of people, it was the first time they ever saw an image, whether in real life or online, of a trans woman in a woman's bathroom that they knew of, right? And so the visceral response from these people of seeing this thing that they, you know, so, so, so much opposed elicited an incredible backlash that I did not anticipate. And my social media filled with people telling me, using three, le three letters, KYS, over and over again, kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself. And I am, at this time, tw 26 years old. I never thought that words on a screen could have such an impact on me. The dark web, the alt-right websites, they filled with these vicious threats on my safety, people doing things that, that I can't in, in, in mixed company talk about because they're so inappropriate. And for the first time in my life, the thought of suicide became, for an instant, a rational thought. I, I, I wouldn't say I was suicidal, but for a moment it became a rational thought, which I had never had in my life. And afterwards, I, you know, fortunately I snapped out of it, and, 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 and afterwards I wondered, can I do this work? Can I, can I, can I be a public person? This, is, this hate is affecting me so much, and I don't know if I can deal with it. I'm either going to have to do this and be miserable or not do this at all. And so I did a lot of soul searching, and I did a lot of research. And I, in, one, in particular, listened to this one podcast, uh, This American Life podcast, where they interviewed a reporter who was very open and positive about her weight and they explored the trolling that she experienced. And that podcast in particular left me with an important understanding that, that her experience, I think, was very analogous to my experience and the experience that LGBTQ people face that she faced as a, uh, an overweight person who had, had sort of em was empowered and, and, and proudly declared that she was a self-identified fat woman. And it was a lesson that I think has carried with me and helps me and, and change, changes the way I look at the bullying that I face and I hope can help give a little bit of, of, of courage to folks who are facing bullying. And that's that all of us deal with an insecurity. Whether it's your sexual orientation, your gender identity, or whether it's how you look, how you sound, where you come from, what you do, all of us deal with something that society says we should be embarrassed by or ashamed of or keep secret. And the thing about LGBTQ people is that we have conquered that insecurity. And in many cases, we've not only conquered that insecurity, but we've walked forward from a place of pride with our held, 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 head held high and said, this is who I am, and I'm not ashamed of it. And the bullies see that power. They see that individual agency in conquering our insecurity, and they are jealous of it. And that's where their bullying comes from. And so know that you are powerful. You are powerful just by being. And for me, that, is, that power is something that I know that I carry with me from the safest of spaces to the scariest of places. And that's true for all of us who are LGBTQ. We are powerful just by being. So I try to make sure that I impart that knowledge of that power to every young person I know. We weren't even able to scratch the surface of uh, the amazing adventure that is Sarah McBride. And so what I'm hoping you'll all do is I'm hoping you're all going to buy her book. I'm hoping that you are going to follow her adventures um, online and in person. Sarah is a, a friend of Philadelphia's. We are, are grateful to have you back in our city. And, um, and we wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here.